going crazy. Oh my god, look at it! Everybody in Spencer has the underground right now. It's May 30th, 1998, and a violent atmosphere exists in eastern South Dakota. A low pressure system sits atop the Missouri River, with warm moist air to the east and cool dry air to the west. On the border sat an explosive environment for severe storms, so explosive that once they initiated, they would travel over 1,000 miles in just 36 hours, heavily damaging eight states. But would there be a tornado? The Storm Prediction Center believed it was possible, issuing a moderate risk for eastern South Dakota in the early morning hours of May 30th, mentioning extreme instability, supercell thunderstorms, and the threat of isolated tornadoes. As the Saturday wore on, cirrostratus covering Nebraska gave way to sunny skies further north, pushing temperatures and dew points to a muggy 82 degrees over 70. A tornado watch was issued at 3.53 p.m. for eastern South Dakota, as cumulus towers erupted to the west. Young storm chaser Bill Reed was sitting in Waterbury, Nebraska, watching the milky skies, caravanning with fellow chasers Martin Licious, Keith Brown, and Cheryl Chang. By 5.45 p.m., a storm appeared on radar just east of Chamberlain, South Dakota. The chase was on. 607 and we're headed north on Interstate 29. Bill and his team attempt to reposition, blasting north on Interstate 29. But for some strange reason, the storm begins to weaken. Just as quickly as it formed, it evaporates. Luckily for the team, this storm formed ahead of the dry line, and along the dry line itself, stronger, discrete supercells were already in progress. While this northern storm near Huron looked quite potent, this southern storm had less atmospheric competition, a better road network, and was directly visible to Bill. With only an hour of daylight left, it would be this storm or bust. Uh, we're coming under an anvil here of a storm near Mitchell in Davison County. As the team turned west on Interstate 90, they watched in real time as the young storm's anvil spread out across the sky. As they approached, the violent rising motion within the storm, called an updraft, became clearly visible. Exiting the highway, they watched as the storm exhibited a dramatic increase in lightning. Unbeknownst to them, a weak tornado had touched down, moving through the rolling grasslands, and lifted three minutes later. Ralph Mahoney took this photo from his front yard, capturing the large dusty cone as it raked through the fields a mile away. And then, a second, stronger tornado barely missing the community of Fulton, it too lifting a few minutes later. The tornado report was broadcast over radio, and Bill and his team decided to stay put, just to the north of Salem, and watch the storm from afar. But would it cycle again? I want to take a moment to show you the one piece of gear that's been keeping me dry no matter where the weather takes me, my Vessi Stormburst sneakers. As someone who spends a lot of time outdoors, whether I'm chasing storms, trekking through muddy backroads, or just grabbing a coffee after a lawn editing session, I need shoes that can handle sudden downpours, wet grass, and even early fall chill. The Stormburst sneakers are 100% waterproof thanks to Vessi's Dymatex technology, so whenever the skies open up, I don't have to worry about soaked shoes slowing me down. They've got all-terrain grip for slick roads on trails, cushioned midsoles for all-day comfort, and they're lightweight and breathable even on lawn hikes or storm chase drives. Plus, they're super easy to clean. Mud and dust are gone in seconds. I truly wear them everywhere. They're rugged enough for the worst terrain, but stylish enough for everyday life. And don't sleep on the Vessi socks. They're soft, moisture-wicking, and pair perfectly with these. If you want a shoe that's ready for rain, shine, trail, or town, check out the Stormburst. They come with a one-year warranty, 30-day worry-free returns and free shipping over $110 in North America. And right now, you can get 15% off your first pair at Vessi.com weatherbox or by scanning the QR code on screen. Whether you're storm chasing like me or just chasing an autumn adventure, Vessi's got you covered. To the west of the supercell, a squall line had formed, racing east. As the squall line approached the supercell, the cool dry air expelled by the squall line, called the outflow, converged with the cool dry air exiting the supercell, called the rear flank downdraft. This interaction between squall lines and supercells is often the key ingredient needed to produce a violent tornado. At 8.23 p.m., the third tornado touched down, and this time it was larger and meaner. 
Now in an upgraded PDS Tornado Watch, Bill and his team were still north of Salem, trying to see through the thick sheets of rain. If you are in Farmer, South Dakota, you eight miles northeast of Mitchell, immediately. <laughs> Farmer, the tornado is expected to be near Farmer. Hearing the tornado report, they had two options. They could continue west on Route 38, driving into the storm to get closer, or wait for the tornado to come to them. It was moving at 35 miles an hour, so it wouldn't be long. But tornadoes are fickle, transient beasts, so why not meet the twister halfway? The storm is going pretty intense with the lightning. Some golfers, potential statistics right there. Possibly a rotating funnel cloud on the ground. There it was. The large wedge became visible through the dust. This was a massive tornado. And although it was churning through empty fields, there was one town in the way. And it is going to affect these cities and towns and these times. Farmer at 838, Spencer at 46. The small railroad town of 300 people was now under a tornado warning. Bill and the team had no idea Spencer was a few miles in front of them and they were about to witness its final moments. As word of the tornado warning spread to the Spencer Fire Department, they attempted to turn on the sirens, except the power had gone out. It's unclear exactly how this happened, but now with no siren or televisions to alert the warning, the situation became dire. Thankfully, many saw the monster looming to the west and frantically took shelter at the last possible second. 81-year-old Mabel Allen crouched underneath the first floor staircase of her apartment complex, along with five others. Doug Hoyton grabbed his children and rushed into the basement. Pastor Ward Satterley was getting ready for bed when the sky became dark. He took his wife Gloria by the hand and led her down the basement stairs. But Gloria insisted on going back up to the first floor to get the family dog. And then the house exploded. Bill captures the moment the tornado explodes the town. From four miles away, it's eerily quiet. Pastor Ward came to on the basement floor, surrounded by rubble, with Gloria nowhere in sight. Unfortunately, not being able to make it back to the basement, she was killed. A car now lay upside down in Doug's basement, a mere few feet from where he and his children were sheltered. Miraculously, they all escaped with their lives. The staircase that Mabel had crouched beneath was the only thing left standing in the apartment complex. Within the unit next door, the residents were not so lucky. Mildred Pugh and Irene Yost were killed as the building gave way. These apartments on Main Street were affordable housing for senior citizens. It's a miracle that anyone survived. This area was just to the south of the tornado's center, directly in the path of the maximum 200 mile an hour winds. It was estimated that the F4 wind field impacted this area for two to four seconds, while F2 winds, still above 100 miles per hour, battered these structures for an entire minute. Within that minute, 90% of the town was destroyed. The bank, post office, church, fire department, antique store, water tower, grain bins, dozens of cars, trees, and over a hundred homes. Twelve structures on the north side of town escaped the Twister's outer wind field, a wind field that was now expanding rapidly, heading straight for Bill. Too much, Hold it on. Okay. Too much lightning right now. We're gonna dash uh, south. Time is 8.44 and it went south of the road, out of Salem. The team decides to head south and follow the dust-filled monster as it dove southeast towards I-90. Just before it reaches the interstate, it dissipates. Upon searching the rubble, three more fatalities were identified. Bev Bentliff was trying to close the doors to her home before heading to the basement. 
She was concerned of dust getting blown indoors when, unfortunately, she was pulled out of her house by 200 mile an hour winds. Ronald Selkin and Elizabeth Burnham were also found deceased where their homes once stood. The entire time the tornado was on the ground, a Doppler on wheels was positioned four kilometers west of Spencer, actively scanning the tornado. This was the first time mobile radar wind estimates could be directly compared to structural damage of this magnitude. The results were not surprising. With the radar beam scanning 30 meters above the ground, it measured consistently higher wind speeds than those seen on the ground, meaning that while useful in other ways, mobile radar scanning 100 meters above the ground is not an accurate representation of ground level wind speed. Another issue with the mobile radar operation is the scan duration. Each scan took 50 seconds to produce. To track small-scale features within the tornadic windfield, scans would be needed every 5 to 10 seconds. Imagine your state governor standing in your town on national news, debating whether or not it's worth it to rebuild. In four short weeks, 80% of Spencer would be raised and backfilled, leaving behind a blank slate of mud. But sure enough, the town gave it a shot. Those who wanted to stay wasted no time. New senior apartments were built, as well as a bank, post office, fire department, park, water tower, and a few dozen homes. Although now half the population, Spencer is still alive and wants to leave this disaster in the past where it belongs. Outside the post office exists a memorial for the victims.